Welcome to episode 52. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Who Did That Voice, where we take an in-depth look at voiceovers. It's a new year, and if you're like me, you are already thinking about warmer weather and taking that getaway to that tropical or exotic destination. Maybe you plan to travel to Walt Disney World or Universal Studios. No matter what kind of trip you plan, 3D Travel Company is the company for you. Just visit 3dtravelcompany.com and let them know that Trenton sent you from Who Did That Voice. Or you can book on www.whodidthatvoice.co and click the Book Now button. For a limited time, Who Did That Voice listeners can receive a Disney gift card for qualifying Disney and Universal trips booked and traveled by the end of 2017. Book today and travel away. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today's special guest has played a multitude of different characters, and to begin, he played Beastly on the Care Bears. Beastly! Yes, your meanness. How bad are you? Oh, I'm the baddest of the bad, and even badder than that. Our special guest also played Toad on the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. I always wanted to be taller, but this is ridiculous. Here come the Koopa Troopas. Let's turn them into Koopa Troopas. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, we have John Stalker with us. John, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, John, the very first thing that we always like to do when we start out with an episode is to just get a background on who our special guest is and how did you break into the voiceover industry, John? Wow. Uh, well, many years ago, <laughs> uh, uh, in a land far away, um, Actually, it wasn't a land far away. I, 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 I was uh, born and raised in Toronto, and uh, I always wanted to be an actor. I, uh, I re I, actually, it's one of those early, early memories. I was, uh, I was four, and I came in and told my mom and dad I was going to be an actor. Uh, and, uh, you know, typical, oh, that's good. <laughs> yes, you do that. Uh, and uh, sure enough, that's the way it happened. And I, I did, um, I mean, I, I failed high school my final year of high school twice because I was involved in the school show. So that was kind of, you know, my early amateur days of, uh, of showbiz, if you will. Uh, the final year I, I worked with some guys, we actually, and gals, we, we wrote, uh, our own show, uh, music, uh, the book, there, everything. We did the whole thing. And uh, of course I had no time for, you know, book learning. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Who needed that? Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, so that was a doctor, lawyer, accountant out the window. Uh, <laughs> so I was an actor, and then um, you want to get to the voice part. Um, when I was, uh, I guess, in my early 20s, and, and sort of still picking away at stuff, um, I had um, I got my first agent, and in those days, the industry was different. You could have as many agents as you wanted. Nowadays, you have to be... Um, you you could only have one agent, uh, but the agent that I that I was most closely associated with called and said you could do all kinds of voices, John. I said, yeah. And this is really early days of animation, really early day days of when animation resurged. Many of many of your 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 fans and listeners will remember the name Nelvana, uh, which is from Toronto. I mean that the, Nelvana hadn't wasn't even on the on the map at that point. And uh, these were two commercials for a, some jean, local jeans company. And um, the he said, well, if you can do this, the the producer is coming uh, tomorrow, and he'd like to meet with you. I mean, that never happens today, of course. I said, yeah, okay, nervous as hell. Uh, and I met with him, and he gave me the scripts, and I read them, and one was like a southern kind of stereotypical, you know, like voice 7B, 
Southern, right? And uh, the other one, I'll be damned if I can remember what it was. But anyway, I got the job. So that was my <laughs> first voice job. And after that, when animation started to kind of pour into Toronto, that's when my, my animation uh, days kicked in. Absolutely, John. Well, you know, speaking about animation, in the mid to late 80s, uh, you got to do two different shows for Star Wars, one called Ewoks and the other one called Star Wars Droids. What was it like being a part of that amazing franchise that has extremely blown up today? Well, at that time, it hadn't blown up. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it was like, whoa, this is really cool because I'm, you know... And 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 I worked with the 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 voice actors, not but not directly the C three PO and uh, R two D two guys, but it was all mixed together later. Uh, especially, I think that was uh, I think it was droids that that used them most uh, most closely. I think there was some stuff in Ewoks. Honestly, I I can't remember exactly. But what I did on uh, on droids was really interesting because I was playing the same kind of bad guys. Or, or even sometimes the good guys, but they were, you know, that the early Star Wars stuff, and still to this day, they're they are cartoony. Yeah, they are really outside the box. It's like, it's like they could be animated. Yeah, a lot of them really, really could be. You look yeah. at like Jabba the Hutt. That's a cartoon character. Come on, <laughs> right? And and uh, and a lot of them are. And it was like really fascinating to say I'm a part of this. Even though it was the early days, I mean, when Star Wars came out, it was enormous. It didn't have, of course, the same following because you've got the new Star Wars followers, the old Star Wars followers, and now they've merged with the Trekkies. And I mean, it's it's a whole big thing. <laughs> but still, at that point, it was prestigious. Yeah. It was I was connected to a franchise that was uh, in its, uh, certainly in its early years, but it was very exciting. Do you want to know any of the stuff that happened in that? Sure. Yeah. Tell us, John. Tell us. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, this it was done by Nelvana. Okay. Uh, both of those series, they were really the the early early days for them. Yeah. And the producer Rob Kirkpatrick, uh, whom I still see to this day, and who is still active as a you know as a studio guy, and I won't tell you the name of the studio he's with, but he's he's still active, and I still see him, and he's just a full of life guy. Uh, he would call me in. He was the voice director, producer, uh, direct. He was everything, and he would call me in and say, "Okay, here's a picture, right? Um, what do you got?" And I go. <laughs> Okay. And, and and again, this would never happen today. Yeah. Today, when they cast an audition, you have to be, you can't just be the round peg in the round hole. You've got to have the little bump on the side and the little slit in the thing, and you got to fit perfectly. And creativity is somewhat stifled because you're not allowed to, they don't give you the opportunity to say, yeah, that's good, but just do more of this and more of that. Or they certainly don't just call you in Yeah. say, Here's the role. Here's the picture. Give me a voice. But we would obviously, we would always get it within five or ten minutes. We would have a voice. You say, yeah, that's it, man. That's it. Let's go with it. And uh, it it worked. Yeah. So it was it was a creative time, a really wonderful creative time. Giving you a, a chance to use those improv skills you learned. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, I did a lot of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, aside from being able to be a part of these, you know, these amazing Star Wars shows that were definitely the early days of Star Wars era, um, you were also able to play on a show that I am super infatuated with from my childhood, the Care Bears. Oh, um, yes. And uh, you played Beastly on the series, which I always was like, who is this guy? Like, he has this cool voice. And I, I started researching you, and I was like, oh, it's John Stocker. I was like, I got to get this guy on my show. He's so cool. <laughs> you know, because Beastly, Beastly was one of those voices that was just like, oh, dude, it's just so sinister and, like, creepy cool. You know, like, who is this? You know? <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 and really a wimpy wiener at the same time. <laughs> uh, interesting uh, that, that you would talk about that. I love doing Beastly to this day. When people say, what's, the favorite, what's, what's your favorite character you've ever performed? It's Beastly. He, is, he, to me, is the ideal cartoon character in the sense that the bad guy's sidekick 
is always such a wonderful character. He's got the deepest character. He's multidimensional. Um, and I've done a couple of them. I've done a few of them. But he's always like, you know, like the bad. He, he's bad. He wants to be bad. I and mean, Beastly says, I want to be bad. Right. But he's really got a good heart. <laughs> yeah. It's like, when I, I, you know, I did Babar and I was Basil to Rataxis. And he's, was this, he had the same attitude. And it's a wonderful character because it's, it's a really emotional character. A lot of people will say, oh, it's a cartoon. But, you know, he had more to him than that. Beastly was kind of deep because, you know, he had to be bad on the outside to please no heart, right? Yeah. It was like, you know, I mean, he, he, the guy probably, you know, he had a wife, he had kids, he, you know, he got to go home, he got a mortgage, you know, you know, Beastly, you know, when he, when he went home, you know, Beastly's wife would say, well, what'd you do today, honey? Well, you know, I was, uh, well, I helped you no know, heart. I was, I was rotten to the Care Bears. I mean, what'd you do? Well, I took something from them. Oh, that's good. Did you get paid? Yeah, he told me I'd be paid in 30 days. And I'm okay. <laughs> but the mortgage is due, right? We got our kids are eating the macaroni and cheese and bologna. I'll talk to him then, honey. Right? You know, I can just be... <laughs> You yeah, that. It was just a, you're just a family guy. Yeah, but the gig paid. It was a great gig. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, and another character that I was definitely drawn to was the Rat King in the Care Bears, the Nutcracker. Uh, had a beastly esque kind of sound. Exactly. Um, but you know, he was a different character. But I definitely yeah, I was drawn to him. Voice. So they've asked me. They asked me to do the beast voice. I said, "Come on, guys." Can't do that to me. And they said, no, we want that sort of same feel. I, and I've actually done it a few times. Yeah. Uh, you know, with a lower register, I've done that. And there was a Pigsburg Pigs. I mean, it was a series I did. You would never know Pigsburg Pigs. But I remember doing it, and they and they loved the Beastly. But I said, I'm sorry, I can't do Beastly. Beastly is just Beastly. Yeah. No, I'm not sharing him. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll do this something similar. So I did that. But, you know, I mean, every actor, every voice actor is limited. We're all, we all have limitations. We all have default positions, you know. So, you know, even if they hadn't asked for something specific, we all go back to that sort of style, that feel. Maybe we have three or four or five of them. Yeah. Uh, but we, we default to those and cause they're comfortable and we know from doing them often and from getting the feedback that they're pleasing. Right. So yeah. we, we, we fall into that and that's okay. I mean, ultimately people watching it don't really know we're so visually oriented as opposed to orally oriented yeah. that. You know, you you're a student of the game, and your 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 listeners are students of the game. So they are different. They're voice actor uh, people. Yeah. So they listen and go, "Oh, I know that. Uh, that's the." Da, da, da. But most people don't. Your 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 mass <laughs> audience does not hear the similarities. Another fantastic show that you got to be on was the Real Ghostbusters, where you got to play the Stay Puffed Man, which I think is super fantastic. Um, and, and I believe that was a recurring role in the show, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Actually, I shared the role with Frank Welker. What? Yeah. I we both did the same character. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I did some of them and he did some of them. It's because. Uh, uh, so like a trade off? Well, no. They moved the. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> for those aren't who aren't. For those who aren't watching, uh, I just uh, saw the tape up that. I got some pics of that, but I don't have that character. <laughs> oh, that's a beauty. Yeah, he some of them, and I did. I I don't know why. You know, he's not he's not better than I am. He just makes more money. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys rotated off like some episodes. Oh, were you I don't know. Some of, you know what? I found out I I did a few of them, and he did a few, and I thought, but that happens, you know. And especially, let's face it. Stay puffed was, I mean, come on, you know, <laughs> and I mean, I'd have done it. I probably charged less than, uh, than Frank did, uh, you know, but you know, he's a bigger name than I am and that's, that's great, but he probably charged more and I can just do this. this I can do the same thing. So for <laughs> anybody out there that wants to reprise the series, I'm cheaper and I do the same. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much for giving us that insight into the Stay Puff Man. <laughs> well, John, you know, you've been able to be on some super iconic shows, and one of the favorite shows, or two shows that were favorites of mine, are the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, and then The Adventures of Super Mario Brothers 3, where you got to play Toad on both of those. And I'm a super big Nintendo fan and grew up with the original Nintendo. And I listened and watched these shows as a kid. So to realize you were the Toad, I was like, holy cow, this is super cool. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a fun series. I, I, it's one of those ones um, uh, that I, I remember going up there and, and, and doing it. We did it in a in a studio called Master's Workshop in Toronto. And they call it Master's Workshop because they did religious recordings up there. <laughs> okay. uh, and it's true. And uh, Church sermon right after the cartoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought, oh, man, this is sacrilegious. But I'm doing it anyway because <laughs> I knew uh, the, the checks don't bounce. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and... And I remember doing it, and I, matter of fact, I just saw Walker Boone at a uh, function uh, about a month and a half ago, and Walker played Luigi. No, he played, uh, yes, wait a minute, was he Luigi or Mario? No, he played Mario. Okay. Uh, and uh, and Danny, um, Danny Wells was Luigi. And Danny, Danny, Danny died a couple of years ago. I was, it's funny because I was, I directed him in a series called Ella the Elephant for Disney. And uh, wow, it was the first time we'd gotten to work together in a long time. And Danny was just, he, what a fabulous, consummate professional. <laughs> he was one of those guys, he worked a lot in Hollywood. And Danny was just something, I know I'm being tangential here, but I'm thinking about him. He was just a, just a, just a great guy. And no matter what actor you mentioned to Danny, Say, oh yeah, you know, I worked with him, and let me tell you, and he'd have a story. How about you could name anybody? It's oh yeah, when I did so and so, it's like it's one of those really beautiful guys. And I remember when I worked with him and didn't really know that he was. Well, I mean, a lot of this stuff came after we worked together. Yeah, he was always really one of those nice guys, easy to work with, and he did the on camera and he did. Uh, the voice. He was the only one because Captain Lou Albano did Mario in the uh, in the on camera, but he did not do the voice the voice gig. Okay, okay, right. And Toad, not being real, <laughs> you know, <laughs> was only in the cartoon. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, I still do some cons with um, uh, Tracy Moore, who was Princess Peach or Princess. Oh, okay. Peach. Yeah, we uh, we've done a few things because she was the original Sailor Moon, and so I worked with her on that, and we worked on Redwall together, and we've done we've done a ton of stuff together, uh, and um, yeah, it was um, it was a fun show. I get next to Beastly Toad is a very close second in terms of what people kind of want from me. Yeah. Um, the only problem is they say, oh, do the voice of Toad. You know, when you get older and your falsetto starts to betray you uh <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's like it's like geez i you know I, I gotta warm up my voice before i go go to cons now because somebody's gonna ask me to do toad and i'm gonna sound like like a like a chicken or something it's, <laughs> Well, you know, some voices are forever and some are seasonal. Oh, yeah. it's forever, but it's locked away in my, my brain. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've lost the key. <laughs> well, that's hilarious, John. Thank you so much. You know, you spoke a little bit about directing, and yeah. I know you were on a show called Sailor Moon, and uh, you played Ray's grandpa, and, and Ray is Sailor Mars. Um, yeah. So you played her grandpa, and he just had the name of Ray's grandpa. That was what he was called. Uh, grandpa Hino. Gra Grandpa Hino. Okay, so he did have a name. I didn't recall yes, that. Did. But uh, that I, that show was actually one that you got to voice direct on for the first time, I believe. That is correct, sir. Uh, actually, it's interesting because I did, not only did I do Grandpa Hino on that show, again, it was a shared role. I shared it with an actor called David uh, Fraser, okay. uh, who is, uh, t uh, teaches at one of the community colleges in Toronto. Uh, but uh, but a whole bunch of people did that show. Uh, we, we worked with a director who was just really kind of demanding, producer rather, really kind of demanding. She flip-flopped. If somebody was in the studio, uh, can you do this voice? I, I don't want to bring him in. Uh, and, <laughs> hey, but you're here. It's like, yeah, I can do it. Okay, you do it now. 
<laughs> that's the way it was. And I would I was doing kind of all those weird voices. I would be the the detached voice from above, one of the evil guys. Then I'd be a lovely, a warm uh, kind of character. I'd be the pizza delivery guy. I'd be the doctor. I'd be somebody's father. I was doing all these odd roles, and uh, along with uh, Grandpa Hino. And I was in the studio, and the uh, current voice director, or the, at the time the current voice director, was relieved of his duties, again, because the producer was just a little flighty. Uh, and she turned to me and said, do you want to be uh, the voice director? Uh, and I said, what? <laughs> said, you want to be the voice director? I said, I said Nicole, I've, I've never... Uh, I've never voice directed. So I know that, but I, I think you have, I feel you have what it takes. Wow. Which means you're the only guy in the room. <laughs> but right now. Uh, so I, uh, she said, she actually said, I'm going to give you uh, some time to think about it. I said, how long? She said, tomorrow. Uh, and I, <laughs> so, and actually when I took it on, it was meant quite a, like a pay cut for me because I was working so much and I knew this was going to be um, a very time consuming uh, job, but I don't know, something inside me said, John, do this, just do it. And I did it. And uh, that was the start of um, sort of the other half of my career. I do as much voice directing as I do performing. Wow. Uh, sometimes more. I mean, there are times when I've had five, six shows that I'm voice directing at the same time. And the nice part is, Sometimes I voice direct myself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I know that Stalker is a good performer. Yeah. Yeah. Man, he's good. Man. He's good. I, I love no working notes. with him. <laughs> no notes. You're good. <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, you have played, like I said, on so many shows that have just been like mind blowing. I just couldn't believe it when I was going through everything. And, like you said, your IMBD page has just tons of stuff. And uh, the busy world of Richard Scary that came out in 1994, I was a super big fan of that. And this this era, I was about nine years old probably when this show was out. And it just hit home with me. The music, the intro song was just fantastic. Uh, you played Father Cat, who was the grocery store owner, and Humperdinck, the baker, the pig. And um, they're just, it was a good show. I don't know what it, it was, was that was so yes, captivating it was about it. It was very entertaining. It was happy. It was always up. There were no, there was no moral to the story. It yeah. was just kids are watching. Let's make them smile and, you know, and bounce on their bums and have a good time. <laughs> I did that in, in Montreal, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would go to Montreal to record it. I think I did that in Montreal. I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then I think they moved it to Toronto <laughs> after that. It was a company called Sinar that ran into some really horrific legal issues, bought out by one of the former owners of Nils. And so there's a, an interesting thread. Uh, Michael Hirsch bought Sinar um, and then formed Cookie Jar, uh, which was bought out by DHX Media. And DHX in, in Canada is yeah. a massive animation company. I don't know if you know of them or not. I've seen but them on some of the labels for some of the movies wow, and stuff. That they come out. do so much stuff. Yeah. But it was, a, it was a fun show and there was a spinoff show that I didn't get to do. Curse them to hell. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it was, it was fun. Humphrey Dick and, and Father Cat had the same voice. It's like, uh, I know before we started the, you started recording, I, I said to you, we're really visually, we're not, we're visually oriented, not orally oriented. Yeah. And it, different, when you see, when people see a different character, they, they don't think voice. Yeah. So if you listen back, you will hear that they're very, very similar. <laughs> I even said that the same voice. Well, that's okay. <laughs> okay. All right, as long as you're cool with it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, you're gonna still going to pay me, right? Yes. Okay, I'm going to do it. Okay. Uh, so one of the shows that I really do remember from my childhood, and I think you do too, is Dino Saucers. Oh, and yeah. You played Ankylo and the Terrible Dactyl on that show. Right. Ankylo, actually. Ankylo. It's Ankylo. I'm sorry. Okay. Ankylo. No, that's okay. It's been a long time since I've seen the show. I remember oh, it from my childhood. I, I but I got reminded of it. I got... I got um, an email out of the blue from one of the guys who's who was a insane fan, insane fan. He's uh, 
I guess he's got to be, I don't know, 35 or something, you know. And uh, But he's, uh, and he got in touch with me and said, um, I'm just a really huge fan of the show. Uh, I'll tell you the interesting story about dinosaurs. It was sponsored by Coca-Cola. Oh, really? And out of the gate, out of the gate, we were contracted for 65 episodes. Wow. Which is like unheard of unheard of. i mean today if you get you get 13 or you get 26 yeah and that's it and then they see how it does but 65 episodes and we were all uh all the guys we, they 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 brought guys into the room they brought the top actors from toronto into a room and said okay uh you're gonna do this you're gonna do that what do you got for this Da-da-da. yeah that's good okay you got that i mean they're handing out honest to god it was bizarre. They're like handing out tens of thousands of dollars. I, I don't mean to sound crass. <laughs> like saying, yeah, that's good. Okay, you got that. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> Maybe 30 grand. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. weird. The, it was the 80s. Money was no object at that time. And anyway, we did this. And when we finished, or just as we finished, the upper management of Coca-Cola completely changed it was out the old and in with the new and the series never went to air they just swallowed the cost and uh and nothing happened it was only subsequent to that when uh, they it just it was like i guess they must have said hey we got this thing sitting here uh let's see if anybody wants it and we can recoup some of our money but i mean you're talking about coca-cola yeah. Right. Yeah. Like uh, it's like Walmart losing, you know, if Walmart lost 20 million dollars. Would they blink? No. I think so. No. And and, uh, and Coca-Cola is, you know, somewhat comparable, I'm sure. Uh, and anyway, uh, yeah, it, 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 it kind of took on a cult following, which is interesting. And so I got this um, email from the guy who said, I'm a real fan. And can you help me? And I'm a sucker for helping people research stuff. <laughs> Well, it's fun for me, too. Yeah, yeah. It's really fun. And I get to say, I mean, who the hell did I work with on that? So, oh, <laughs> my God, so-and-so. Jeez, I haven't seen him in whatever. Or, oh, yeah, you know, man, I, he died 10 years ago. And, right? He, he, but it's, it, it's, it, it's fun to do that stuff. And so I connected with him. And, and what I said was, okay, the only thing you've got to do, buddy, because uh, he was talking about cells that he bought on, the, on, the, uh, on eBay. Yeah. So, got to give me you got to give me a good pick of those cells i want a really good jpeg so i can use them and he and i said are you good with that he said 100 percent. and so he sent me and so now i have when i go to cons i have my dinosaurs these beautiful uh 810s that i autograph uh and uh and he's happy because i i did a, a couple of um you know, I did a bunch of work. Well, it wasn't work. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did a bunch of research for him, uh, getting him names of people that are, I mean, a lot of them are out of the business. Yeah. That are with them, as, again, are in that, uh, you know, that great animated series in the sky. And, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and so it was fun. I mean, I, I love when that stuff happens. And I do get it occasionally. Dinosaurs was one of them. Great series. It's funny because I went to a con once the, about five years ago, and I listened, I was walking by a room where they were showing, maybe they were just doing retro something or other, and I hear a line, a couple of lines, and I thought, damn, that's me. <laughs> what the hell is that? That sort of, there's a familiarity to it. And I went in and they were showing uh, a piece of, of diet sausage. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's really neat. <laughs> you start listening into something, you're like, "Why am I talking over there? That's not me." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why somebody's oh, stolen my voice? <laughs> oh, it's me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's okay, Dad. <laughs> Never as mind. You as you were, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, well, do you remember being on at the Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin? Oh my God, let me. I got a huge story. <laughs> huge Teddy Ruxpin story again. I was uh, contacted by someone who's a fan uh, and who asked me for, again, can you give me the, the cast and the crew? 
Teddy Ruxpin was a really wonderful, really wonderful experience. One of my truly top few experiences. I was called by um, the voice director, Chuck Rubin, with whom I am still very good friends. He lives in, um, in Mexico. He lives in a, a little mountain town in Mexico called San Miguel de Allende. And my wife and I go there every year. We're going again January and February. Awesome. And I go and I see him and we drink lots of beer and tequila and eat <laughs> lots of wings. And, uh, and he's still like my, my dear, dear buddy. Uh, he, he got a call to do the series, Teddy Ruxman, and called me and said, if you can do this voice or really close to it, the gig's yours. I did it, and he said, man, they said, you're bang on. I said, it's yours. So, <laughs> okay, what do I do? Now, this was the long before the days of MP3s and uh, the Internet uh, use that we have today or the Internet facility that we, we have today. So they would fly me from Toronto to Ottawa, where it was done by a company called Crawley Films, uh, owned by a guy named Bill Steven. And this was one of his few projects. Uh, actually, the company, I think after this, uh, went into receivership. I, I could be wrong. I don't want to be sued, so I'm going to qualify it immediately. <laughs> uh, and uh, But, yeah, it, it just didn't. Uh, it, it, it Something happened. It wasn't Teddy Ruxman's fault because the series was hugely popular. And, again, it was 65 episodes, and it was, it's the only series that I've ever done, and it's been mentioned in, in a lot of the, uh, the chat rooms and stuff. It was sequential. Like, if you missed shows, you would miss something that happened. It wasn't like watching a cartoon where every show, you may not know who the characters are, but you don't have to watch the previous show to know what's happening in the current show. Yeah, yeah. And so it was sequential. For 65 episodes. Wow. They would bring in Will Ryan from L.A. They'd fly him up. This was every other weekend. Not during the week. They'd bring him up on the weekend. Bring us in on the weekends. Will Ryan. And then Will's a few years older than I am. And um, still working. Still does. You still see his credits in some of the, the Hollywood movies. And Phil Barron, who is actually a cantor now. Uh, in, uh, in, in outside of L.A., but still is in the game. And he's the guy who, along with, it was Bill Forsey, forgive me if I, my name is, the name, I got the name wrong, but he was the voice of Teddy, and he sang, uh, and he's, he had that high, that warm, that uh, tenor, soft tenor sound. And we would get together, and Saturday and so Friday, well, sometimes Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, and we'd do, I think it was five episodes over the course of the weekend. And late Sunday was the music session, if I'm, again, if I recall correctly. And, um, and I, would, I was Newton Gimmick, that befuddled inventor, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, Phil was Teddy, Will Ryan was Grubby, and then there was a cast of local Ottawa people who would fill in the rest of the of the roles. And it was fabulous. I couldn't wait to go. I'd get on a plane every Friday afternoon in Toronto and fly to Ottawa and come home Sunday night or Monday morning, whatever it was. And uh, God, we had such a good time. And the camaraderie was magnificent. Well, that is fantastic. I didn't realize Will Ryan was on that show. There's a new Teddy Ruxman. It's being released in, I think, May really? of 2017. They're bringing back the singing bear. The actual figure? The doll? The, the, the bear that moved and talked and oh, sang. Oh, wow. Digital. And they, it's one of the top 100 selling toys of all time. It's what I remember the most. I remember snippets from the show. Very minute pictures and flashes from my childhood but i remember the talking doll you used to put a cassette tape in i think in his back and That's then right. he talked I recording I, yeah. I had one you know it's one of those damn i threw it in the garbage I wish I <laughs> you're like oh Ooh. why yeah but, a, <laughs> but they're bringing it back fantastic and i really really hope i, I mean i really really hope uh, they um uh, if they're using because they didn't say they were using new people that if they if they would use um, Phil 
to, to do it. His voice was just so sweet. Of course, I mean, of course, things change, and I'm, I'm a nostalgist, but, yeah. you know, you have to bring it up to current standards and current uh, uh, levels of acceptance and everything else. But I'm really hoping they rerun the series. They've said nothing. But if the toy, I, I'm sure, is successful, hopefully they'll rerun the series. That'd be I, fantastic. Be, I know. That would be I'd wonderful. Be, God damn it, I'd be a fan watching. Yeah, I would too. Because I remember the little cassette tapes were like stories and Teddy would like talk yeah. to you, but he like opened his mouth and closed his eyes. And yeah. it was so real for the time that Google when it. that first came out. Google the new Teddy Ruxpin bear. When you see the eyes, though... When you see those eyes, you'll go, oh, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. He looks a little uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's a little scary. Uh, I think they got to do something but the eyes because they kind of look right through you and they, they, it's, it, it's a little frightening. <laughs> I'm sure that, you know, the five, six, eight-year-olds will be traumatized probably forever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember that doll. Oh, that. Oh, that remember Teddy. Oh, buddy. No, no, Teddy. Bed with you. Look, oh, I brought wow. you a Teddy Ruxpin bed. No! <laughs> hey, paisanos, it's the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Hey, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying part one with John Stalker. Tune in next Friday to hear part two and the conclusion of this interview. You know, a question you might ask yourself is, where can I listen to Who Did That Voice? That's an excellent question. You can hear us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, YouTube, and our website at www.whodidthatvoice.co. Click the Episodes tab and listen away.